Why do you think, in general, it is a, a good idea to clone a Neanderthal? Well, I think that it's it's a good idea to discuss this sort of thing the way we discuss synthetic biology and and personal genomics uh, in advance of it being uh, feasible uh, because sometimes these things creep up on us quite quite quickly. Uh, it's important to discuss the goals of our society with respect to um, neurodiversity, which is one of the things we might learn um, from uh, a detailed understanding of Neanderthal. They're almost certainly different from us in the way they think. And, uh, and, and, and also it could be illuminating about uh, how we approach the issues of biomedical safety and, and discrimination and, and stigmatization and so forth. Could you say a little bit more about this idea of neural diversity and how it relates to Neanderthals? Well, we have in our own population uh, a variety of, of individuals who, uh, you know, cover a spectrum of, uh, of uh, neurodiversity, meaning that the high-functioning autistics, dyslexics, narcoleptics, uh, even bipolar have been major world leaders and thought leaders, um, despite uh, or possibly because of their uh, uh, neural diversity. And as we go further and further afield from our species, uh, we will find, uh, we, might, we might find additional uh, highly optimal, you know, these are, these are not like these are mutants, uh, in, in these are highly optimal uh, sibling or, you know, cousin, uh, Variations on, on on the human uh, existence. Is it already technically possible to do so to clone a Neanderthal, and what would cost be? So uh, there are at least two uh, technological barriers right now. One is human cloning has not been demonstrated. Uh, I mean, we can we can uh, grow human stem cells, but, but making an entire human being has not been demonstrated yet. And secondly, then making the extensive number of changes in the human genome that would be required uh, to to uh, represent even a, a fraction of the, of the Neanderthal uh, traits, uh, phenotypes, the, the things that make Neanderthals different from us. It could be a small number of genetic changes, or it could be a large number. But anyway, that as it gets as that number gets larger, it becomes technologically challenging. But we've seen huge changes in genetics technology. Uh, say a millionfold uh, decrease in our in the price of reading uh, human genomes, and so it's not totally naive to think that we might see similar cost reductions in writing human genomes. Which specific techniques would be required? And I remember reading somewhere about a technology called Mage, M A G E. And would you provide the actual details on how the cloning process would actually be carried out? So it depends on how many changes you want to make, but typically, but things very similar to this are done in in mice and uh, and can be done in human cells, um, but whole mice and human cells, uh, which is that you can change uh, large blocks of DNA multiple times, and you can make multiple positions in the genome uh, uh, change multiple times. And this uh, mage that you mentioned could be used for engineering large blocks of human DNA in, uh, as artificial chromosomes in bacteria, and then you can move them back uh, into human stem cells. All, all of this is working and subject to lots of improvements in cost and, and quality control, but, it's, but it's, the, the pathway is fairly uh, clear at this point. Uh, later on, we'll get into some of the ethical issues that people have raised, but you had a unique way of possibly doing this by using a chimpanzee. Uh, could you talk a bit more about that? Well, I think that probably more likely, if, if this is to be done, and we're really in the discussion stage, it's more likely that it will be done in an era after human cloning is accepted, it, uh, assuming there is such an era. So. Um, where we might become comfortable, much more comfortable with the, the precision and, and medical significance of human cloning um, by uh, seeing it work very, very well in agricultural uh, animals and seeing it work very well in human uh, somatic cloning. 
uh, making uh, tissues that are from me and intended to go back into me uh, for you. And uh, so basically tissues that are self-compatible so you don't have to go out and find a tissue donor. Once we're much more comfortable with the uh, medical safety and efficacy of those types of things, then we will probably be more comfortable with human cloning um, in the same sense of other reproductive uh, technologies that are now in, in routine use like in vitro fertilization or test tube babies. And then once we're a human, comfortable with human cloning, it's, it's unlikely that we would go to chimpanzee because they are considerably further away from both Neanderthal and Neanderthal is basically another human. If scientists are eventually successful in cloning a Neanderthal, what specific t types of information would we learn from studying our evolutionary cousins? Well, I mean, some of this you, you don't really know until you start, but uh, certainly there are examples of, of uh, viruses that are human-specific. They don't infect some of our close, uh, close, close related species. Neanderthals might be resistant to some of them, uh, naturally. Lack, you know, for example, they might be lacking the receptor on the cell surface that binds to the, the viruses which was already the case for there are certain humans that are resistant to eight, that, that don't have the receptor for HIV. So we might learn, uh, might get access to a large number of pathogen resistance genes uh, that are already present in the Neanderthal genome. And then again, we might learn more about neurodiversity, which, is, which we just mentioned earlier. Now the million dollar question. Neanderthals are a member of our own genus, Homo. And a report last year noted that everyone alive today with a European or Asian ancestry has DNA containing 2 to 4 percent of the Neanderthal genome. Obviously, some interbreeding took place between H. sapiens and H. Neanderthal, H. Neanderthalensis sometime in the past. What would you say to those who claim that clone, cloning a being so close to us genetically is unethical? Well, it, it depends on uh, whether cloning a human is unethical. Uh, so I think that what's considered unethical is highly related to how well it works and how important it is for, uh, for some medical goal. So when in vitro fertilization was first introduced uh, in 1978, this was considered a test tube baby and it was considered kind of icky and, and possibly unethical because it could, it, it, it could go wrong in some way or another. Uh, but now, uh, many years later, um, it's, it's, it's kind of flipped around where it's considered unethical to deny infertile couples the ability to have their own baby. And the same thing could happen with human cloning. And once, it, once human cloning is, if human cloning is considered uh, justified and ethical, then, um, then it's a smaller step to, uh, I mean, at that point, Neanderthal is no longer considered a, dis, uh, a close relative, it's considered uh, another human. So, looking into your crystal ball, taking all these technological and ethical questions into into account, roughly, when do you think we might be able to do this? Well, it depends on what you mean by this. So, they, cloning it, a Neanderthal. It, it, well, even cloning a Neanderthal uh, f first. Uh, when when will be be cloning humans routinely, and and that's partly dependent upon the rate of of uh, technological progress, the rate at which society finds or fails to find value in it. Um, but I would, and also it depends on how many of the Neanderthal trait genes you want to introduce. If it's just one or two, then, then it could be done, you know, in a year or two. If it's, if it's thousands of changes or millions of changes, then it, then it will take longer. But, uh, you know, I would say that we're, 10 years is not out of the question. 